He is risen. He is risen it is so good to have you with us today. Welcome to all of you who are visiting with us at church this morning. What is church? Uh, there's a misnomer going about that it's a group of people who think they have it all together, that have got it all figured out, that we're all moral, that we understand the world better than everybody else. That's not true. Church is a community of sinners saved by grace. That's what we are. And we ought to be amongst all people the most humble because we have been covered with the righteousness of Christ. And that's what we celebrate at Easter. We're so glad you're here to do this with us today as we bring praise to the risen King. A couple of uh, announcements to be aware of today. First of all, uh, if you're visiting and you've never been here with us before and you're looking for a church home, we'd love to get to know you after the service. You could give us basic information about you. There's a QR code in the back of the bulletin. If you'd like to do that, we'd love to have you return at another time. There is no Sunday school today, but there is an egg hunt for the children after the service concludes. We just invite them to come out with their parents and meet with Jackie, who's going to be coordinating it. Don't let them just run out and start, uh, okay? We're going to try to have a little bit of order in things today, but meet Jackie out front after the service today. Other announcements are located in the back of the bulletin. When we were last here on Good Friday, we concluded uh, hearing the words of Mary, who was grieving at the cross and filled with dread and hopelessness after the death of her son, Jesus. But the story wasn't over, was it? The Bible tells us, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled, and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen as he said. Come, see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Jesus is real. 
Glory, glory, glory is the Lord God Almighty. Let's stand as we enter into the presence of this God, the risen Christ, and follow along with me in this call to worship in your bulletins this morning. Rejoice! There is great news. Christ is risen. Christ is risen Let all the earth proclaim the joy. Hallelujah. Christ is risen.
Almighty, eternal, infinite God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we come to praise you this morning, for you are the only one worthy of highest praise, Lord. You created this world, the universe, and all that is in it, and just as you created this world, you have prepared this morning gloriously bright for us. Father, at the beginning, you spoke light into the darkness, and it was so. And when sin entered this world and began to uncreate it and threaten to undo us and usher in an eternal darkness, you once again 
entered the darkness, Lord, and spoke into it through your son, Jesus Christ. But when he was crucified on that cross, darkness and death seemed to reign. However, Lord, what we celebrate this morning, what we exalt you for, what we praise you for, is that death no longer has the final word. It has lost its victory. It has lost its sting because the tomb of Jesus is empty. The grave clothes have been left behind. Christ our Lord has risen from the dead. Love has conquered. Light has won. And through the power of your Holy Spirit, your people who have put their faith and trust in you will also leave their grave clothes behind. And the, and the world and the darkness will not hold us, Lord, and we will reign with you forever. In Christ alone is any of this possible. And until you return, Lord, and call us home, we stand in your power and praise you and thank you for all that you have done that you alone could do. Receive our praise, receive our thanksgiving, receive our lives. We pray this in the mighty name of the risen Christ. Amen. 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 You may be seated. There's no doubt that there is something special about Easter. There's a joy that is felt as we sing these songs, as we hear the instruments, our voices are even louder. For the believer, for the Christian, that's because Easter is the very foundation of the hope that we have. The hope that just as Jesus rose, we also will one day rise. Easter is a claim that all that is wrong with the world, death itself, will one day be no more. And it's also a claim that all that we hope for, the joy, experiencing eternal life, will be so because a human being walked out of a physical, historical grave. We know how unbelievable that sounds. Even the historical eyewitnesses had trouble believing what they had seen. They said, and they thought when the women told them that Jesus had risen from the grave, they thought it was but an idle tale. And even we now, 2,000 years later, even though we have the historical documents, even though we read about the eyewitnesses to an empty tomb, that Jesus' body is no longer in a grave, even though the eyewitnesses say that they touched him, they heard him, they saw him alive three days after he died, we still struggle to believe this because it's unbelievable. What's even harder to believe, I think, are the implications of what the resurrection will actually do for us. That it means that we too will also one day rise. And that is what Paul was speaking to in 1 Corinthians 15, the implications of the resurrection of Jesus. Follow along with me as I read from your bulletins. Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say, that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God, that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. This morning is a reminder to us that because Jesus has died and risen from the dead, so too are our sins forgiven and we too shall one day rise from the dead. Is there anyone more worthy of praise than the Jesus who has done this? Is there anyone more worthy of your thanksgiving? People of God, rejoice and give thanks to God for making us alive in Christ. Thanks be to God. 
Now may the peace of Christ be with you all. We're, we will stand in just a moment and pass the peace, but after the passing of the peace, uh, we will sing a song celebrating and giving thanks to this eternally worthy God, and then children can come forward for a special Easter sermon. Because of what Jesus has done, we have peace with the Lord, and therefore we have peace with one another. So please stand and greet one another in that peace.
How's everyone doing this morning? We got we got a lot of kids. Let's keep let's bump it up just a little bit. We might need to come out to the side just a little bit if you want. Scoot over here. Over here. Hello. It's lovely to see everybody. How's everyone's Easter's going this morning? Yeah, if you guys want to come over here and come sit right over here. Good, good, good. Good. Um, okay, so the uh, last week, uh, you guys came up, and Pastor Polsky uh, wanted to teach you guys one word um, in relation to Easter, or Palm Sunday. Do you remember what that word was? Hosanna. Hosanna. Nailed it. Yes. Okay. And does anyone remember what Hosanna means? Oh, I'm going to pick him this time. Save us. Phenomenal. Wow. You're doing your job well. Okay. <laughs> Teaching the kids. Phenomenal. Okay, so uh, I want to teach you a a new word and the meaning of a new word today, and that is the word Easter, okay? Easter is a word that we say all the time, but one that we don't often uh, know what it means. Does anybody know what Easter means? Well, I'm going to teach you. Okay. Uh, Easter is just a a, a translation, an English translation of the Greek word pashka, where we say Passover. It's in relation uh, to the the Passover celebration of an Jesus was uh, instituting the Lord's Supper, but all that. But I want to uh, show you, give uh, four visual representations uh, for what Easter means to help describe it to you. Um, so yesterday, uh, my wife, uh, son, and I, we got to uh, boil eggs, and then we we dipped them in uh, uh, food dyes and colors. We got to make real eggs, and it was really fun. But today, all I have for you is plastic eggs, so I'm sorry. But um, so the, uh, I have four representations to describe to you what the meaning of Easter is, but I'm going to ask for a volunteer. Does somebody want to open up my first egg? I think I saw your hand first. Okay. All right. First egg. What do you got? What is it? Oh, that was the wrong egg. <laughs> what do you got? An earring. An earring, but what is the earring of? The cross. There you go. Nailed it. Yes. Uh, it's the only cross I could have was my wife's hearing. So the, the cross. Okay. Yes. So uh, what does the cross represent? Yep. The place that Jesus died. Yes. Yes. Very good. Okay. Who wants to open up my second egg? I saw your hand first. Nails. nails. Okay. Yes. Now we have the right egg. Okay. Nails is in the second. Cr- so what, is, what do nails mean? Yes, so uh, Jesus was nailed to the cross, and these represent um, the suffering, not only physically that he underwent, but spiritually um, taking on the wrath of God on the cross. Okay, who wants to open up my third egg? I think I saw your hand right here. Okay, go ahead. What do you got? A rock. Yes, a rock. Uh, Well, I couldn't fit a whole stone inside of an Easter egg, so it's, it's supposed to symbolize a stone. Do you know what the stone is in the Easter story? Yeah. That Jesus wouldn't build a cave. That's very close. Jesus was close to in a cave. Yes. What was the what is the stone? Yes. Jesus. When Jesus was put into a tomb, a, a stone was put over his tomb, uh, not so that he couldn't get out, because people thought that he was dead. But what it was talked about was the stone was put up so that none of his followers could come in and get him. Uh, so it's interesting to note, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on, yeah, oh, wow, eager beavers, very fun, good. I love the energy on Easter, let's, let's go, let's take this outside to Easter egg hunt later. So these three symbols, the cross, the nails, and the stone, um, the, all three of these uh, symbols represent seeming defeat. If, uh, what the, the cross, what it symbolizes uh, would be Jesus being condemned, not only by his own people, but by the Roman government. It seems like Jesus uh, was condemned by his people and he was defeated in this way. The nails, what they uh, represent is seeming defeat in the sense of uh, he couldn't get off the cross. He was nailed there, um, and he was going to be there until he died. And the final symbol of defeat would have been this stone. That no matter what had happened, they're going to lock him away with a stone so big uh, that no one could ever move it. It took three men just to move the stone. Yes, but this leads me to my fourth egg. Who wants to open my fourth egg? Okay, yes, I've seen your hand every time. You got it. No, no, back here, back here. Every time. Okay, what's in that one? Nothing. Wait, really? Oh, okay. Yes, nothing. Uh, nothing is supposed to be in that egg. I didn't actually just 
bring a fourth egg for no reason. Uh, the fourth egg represents, yep, okay, what do you got? Um, Jesus, rising from the dead. Jesus rising from the dead. Yes and amen. Yes, Jesus rising, go ahead. Can you get it in? Nice work. <laughs> Jesus rising from the, don't that with the nails. Hold those, hold those, hold those. <laughs> hold on, <laughs> okay. The fourth egg, uh, what it symbolizes and represents is that Jesus rose from the dead. All three of those symbols that seemingly meant defeat, a cross being condemned by his people, nails that he couldn't get away from, or a stone put over his tomb, Jesus overcome and vanquished and conquered. So what does Easter mean? Easter means that Jesus actually rose from the dead. When, when two of his followers, both named Mary, came to, to see him on Sunday after he had been crucified and buried, they came to the tomb and they found that the, the stone had been rolled away and it was empty on the inside. And an angel was inside. Um, and the angel spoke to them and said, Come, see the place where he has lain. Um, just, he has risen just as he said that he would. Jesus proclaimed his resurrection over and over again. And the reason that we Christians come around and celebrate this is because this is the most important day. Some people think that Christmas is the most important day in the Christian calendar, but it's, it's Easter. This is the big day. This is the day that we celebrate Jesus risen from the dead. So uh, Easter means one more thing. And that Easter isn't just fun facts, but actually Easter is asking something of you. What Easter is asking of you is to believe. Uh, this isn't just a story that we tell people, but the reason everybody is in this room, the reason that your parents tell you this Easter story over and over again is because that Jesus is asking you to believe that he actually rose from the dead. So in just a moment, I'm going to pray and pray for all of us that we would believe this Easter. And then I believe Miss Jackie has Easter baskets that she's going to be handing out bags, Easter bags to hand out. Uh, because afterwards, again, we're doing an Easter egg hunt. There will be no stones and there will be no nails in the eggs out there, I promise. Um, yeah. <laughs> huh? Hopefully candy, we'll find out. But um, I'm going to pray and then if you would come over here to Miss Jackie and she'll give you uh, a bag. Actually, can I have those eggs back real quick before we, uh, yes, safety hazards from the children. Thank you. Okay. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, on this Easter day we can come around and celebrate you uh, and the joy of what Easter is. Lord, uh, as we look outside, as we see uh, the blooming flowers, so as we see the trees coming into full blossom, Lord, as we see um, bunnies and as we see all kinds of new life coming around, we recognize that um, through your resurrection you brought about new life. I pray that each and every one of these children here would believe in that new life and that through your name they may find life. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. All right, again, if you'd please go over here to Miss Jackie and grab an Easter bag.
Lord, we lift up our nation and our leaders. We ask that you give them wisdom and understanding in their judgments with a love for righteousness and peace. We lift up our servicemen and women and our first responders. We ask that you keep them safe and protect them even in the most difficult situations. We pray for our missionaries and the persecuted church around the world. We ask that you will protect and provide for them as they bring forth your gospel message and lead the lost to Christ. Lord, we pray for the children's ministry here at Trinity. We ask that you'll send forth teachers who will love and nurture our covenant children. And Father, as we gather here today to worship you, give us an understanding of how better to serve you and glorify you. As we prepare for this morning's sermon, we lift up Pastor Polsky to boldly proclaim your word. We ask that you will quiet our minds and open our hearts to receive your word and to live out its truth in all areas of our life. And finally, as we prepare to give your tithes and offerings, we pray that you will bless them to further your kingdom in the proclamation of Jesus Christ, our risen Savior.
Please turn with me in your Bibles to John 19. Thank you to all of these folks who have uh, contributed this morning musically uh, and instrumentally. We're grateful to have such a wonderful group of people blessing us this morning on this joyful day of Easter. We've been in a series that we started last week, a short series called In the Garden. And we started in the Garden of delight, the Garden of Eden. God's plan for the world was laid out in the Garden of Eden, uh, which very sadly and very quickly turned into the Garden of Despair because of sin. And then we jumped forward on Good Friday to another garden, the Garden of Gethsemane, which we think of as the Garden of Tears, where Jesus shed tears for His people as He made His way to the cross and was buried in a garden of death. And this morning, we come together in a new garden, a garden of life. The cross that's before you here this morning, you'll remember when we began Lent, uh, we placed those dead twigs in it. It is bursting with life today as a symbol of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we're glad you're here today with us in this garden of life, because Easter is a day of possibilities. It's a day of enormous possibilities in the lives of every one of us to rediscover joy. How can that happen? We have a world that seems to be weighed down with a lot of uh, darkness and sadness. Well, the prescription that the Bible gives to us for the rediscovery of joy is to believe the Scriptures And to admit that we all need Jesus to be saved. It's a very simple prescription that takes us from the garden of tears to the garden of life. Which we're going to read about here in just a moment. And look again together at what happened on that Easter morning. And So would you follow along in your Bible if you have it? If not, pick up one of the pew Bibles in front of you. There will also be the words on the screen as I read beginning in John chapter 20. In verses 1 to 9, this is God's holy, inerrant, and inspired word. This is what it says to us. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. And so she she ran and she went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. And so Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scripture that he must rise from the dead. This ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray together. Father, help us for a few minutes this morning especially to be attentive to your word. I know, Lord, many here believe. Some here may not. Some may not be here on their own choosing, but may have come because they felt pressure or were asked to come, Lord. We're grateful, though, that we're all in this place together. We pray that this time would not be wasted that you would use it in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So after the first garden, death reigned. 
In fact, in the book of Genesis, over the first few chapters, as the genealogies unfold, you find the names of the great patriarchs listed there, like Adam, who lived 930 years and he died. And then Seth and Enosh and Kenan, and one after another tells about the length of their life. And at the end of that description, it says, and he died. From that moment in the garden, death reigned because of sin. It's for that reason that cemeteries became a necessary part of the world that we live in. And if you've been to cemeteries, as I'm sure you all have, they are often beautiful, but still sad. We uh, pastored uh, in Georgia for a number of years on St. Simon's Island, and there's a little church uh, in the, there called Christ Church. It was the church where the Wesley brothers came to America to preach the gospel in the 1700s. It was literally uh, just a short walk outside of our neighborhood, and we would take walks into that churchyard with our children when they were very young. And inside of that churchyard with the beautiful moss and the limbs hanging were these ancient graves. And it was the kind of place that you'd go, not because it was spooky, but because it was beautiful. And you'd read the gravestones and see the years etched there, 1723 to 1773, and you could see the stories of lives unfold, which reminded us again and again that death has not been defeated. It remains our enemy. So what do we do with the death of Jesus and all that went with it? Is it believable what happened to Jesus? Is the resurrection believable? The first question I want us to think about just for a few moments is the question, did Jesus really die on Good Friday? I know many of you here believe that he did, but some may not. Let's talk about it for a moment. It says in the Bible in John 19 verse 41, in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. Now, if you've ever been to Jerusalem, you know that there's two sites where the tomb of Christ is supposed to be. One might be uh, where the Church of the Holy Sepulcher is. The other one is just a short walk away from that location, and it's called the Garden Tomb. And you can see a picture of it there. It literally is a garden tomb located just a couple hundred steps away from where the hill of Golgotha was, where Jesus was died. And we know that Jesus was laid in the tomb of a member of the Sanhedrin, a Pharisee named Joseph of Arimathea. And he took him to that tomb because he was a believer in Jesus Christ. And it was an honor for him to lay Jesus in the tomb of his own family. Because he and everyone else that had heard and seen what had happened on the day of crucifixion believed that the end had come. That this great prophet Jesus, who had preached wonderful things and done amazing miracles, had died and deserved an honorable burial. Now, many people believe that Jesus never actually died. Did you know that? There's a whole theory that Jesus swooned on the cross. He fainted. But is that the evidence that the Scriptures provide? Is that the evidence that history provides? Do you know that two of the world's most famous historians that we rely on today, people beyond Christian faith, secular people, rely on to help us understand this period of time in Rome and across the Mediterranean basin were Tacitus and Josephus. They both lived and wrote in the first century. And both Josephus, a Jew, and Tacitus, a Roman, describe in their historical writings that a man named Jesus was crucified and died in Jerusalem on that day. They had no reason to make those affirmations of faith. They didn't believe in Jesus as Messiah. But even they, as secular historians, acknowledge that Jesus actually died. He didn't just faint. And how could he truly have fainted? Because we know from the Scriptures in the account in John 19... What happened to him on the cross? If you look back to verses 33 to 37 of John 19, when they came to Jesus, that is, the soldiers, and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs, which was the custom. 
when a man was being crucified, it would hasten their death. You'd break their legs. They couldn't push up to breathe. And in a matter of moments after doing that, they would expire. But when they came to break the legs of Jesus, they recognized these Roman soldiers who did many crucifixions and knew exactly what was happening did not break his legs. Why, it says, because he was already dead. But one of the soldiers, verse 34, pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. And John writing this says, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true. He knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, They will look on him whom they have pierced. Now some people think, at the piercing of Jesus' side, that the fact that blood and water came out was some some, uh, sign from God about baptism and the communion. But it's really much more simple than that. And any medical doctor could tell you what was happening here because Jesus had been subjected for over 24 hours to beatings and whippings and he lost massive amounts of blood. And what happens when a person loses massive amounts of blood is they go into hypovolemic shock. And their body begins to compensate for that. And one of the things that happens to your heart is called pericardial effusion. Your heart is surrounded by a sack of water to hold it tighter so that the blood pressure will stay up. And your lungs are surrounded uh, in a, a state called pleural effusion with water so that they can try to breathe. It puts pressure so your body keeps blood pressure up. So when they jabbed Jesus with that spear that day, and blood and water came out. It's bearing witness to the medical realities of what had happened to the man. He was dead. He was dead. Everyone there knew he was dead. It's only those who do not believe that have had to invent theories to say that a man could have been subjected to what he was and somehow made it off the cross with the Roman soldiers who knew what they were doing and fainted and was laid in a cold, dark tomb and awakened himself. It's laughable. Jesus died that day. And he died in a way that fulfilled scriptures. That Psalm 34 said his bones would not be broken. Zechariah 10 said his body would be pierced. We know Jesus died because the the soldiers at the cross made sure he was dead. We also know he died because they laid him in a tomb. John 19, 42. So because the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. And they posted a guard. Matthew 27 tells us that they posted a guard at the tomb because they didn't want more trouble in Jerusalem. They didn't want anyone stealing the man's body. They didn't want anything to go wrong. They wanted to keep close caps on it. So the Romans posted a guard, which was between 8 or 16 soldiers that would have stood guard in shifts at the tomb of Jesus. And they sealed this massive stone with a special seal from Pilate that only Pilate could break. But on Sunday morning, Easter morning, as Mary made her way to the tomb with the other women to anoint the body of Jesus, while it was still dark, she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb and the soldiers were gone. How did that happen? Well, Matthew 28 tells us that the stone was moved by an angel. Listen, and behold, there was a great earthquake For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come and see the place where he lay. Now people laugh at this. I say it's drama, it's theater. It's just like modern storytelling. And I'd submit to you and to them, actually it's the opposite. Modern storytelling imitates the wonder of what happened this day. Because if there is a God, if there is truly a God who made the heavens and earth and everything in Him, why couldn't this have happened? 
Why not? The angel rolled the stone away. Jesus emerged from the tomb. And the implications of what happened that day have shaken the world. They have shaken the entire world. It was, for many, an offense that he died. To claim that a man died and came back from the dead is an offense. And the Bible prophesied this back in the book of Isaiah. It said, The Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become, listen, he will become a sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. That was written 800 years before Jesus even came to the earth to do his work. But he would be a stone of stumbling. That it, the craziness, the foolishness of the idea of a man coming back from the dead to free people from their sins, for many people, would be laughable. And it has been. Newsweek did a, a, an article on the effect of Jesus' death and the claim of his resurrection a number of years ago. And in that article, the writer made a, a, startling, a startlingly astute point. He said, clearly the cross separates the Christ of Christianity from every other Jesus. In Judaism, there is no precedent for a Messiah who dies, much less a criminal. In Islam, the story of Jesus' death is rejected as an affront to Allah. Hindus can accept only a Jesus who passes into peaceful samadhi, the state of self-realization, and thereby escapes the degradation of death. The figure of the crucified Christ, says one Buddhist, is a very painful image to me because it does not contain joy or peace. The death and resurrection of Jesus was the stone of stumbling. And maybe it is for some of us here today. But the question of whether or not it happened remains the most significant question that any human being will ever ask and answer. Because if it's not true, as was read earlier from 1 Corinthians 15, then what we're doing here is a sham. And we will end up just like every single secular atheist in the world will die and that's it. If it is true, there are implications for that that reverberate through all of our lives and all of the world. And so everyone needs to have an answer to whether or not Jesus died and was resurrected, whether Jesus turned the garden of death indeed into a garden of life. So is the resurrection believable? It's kind of an interesting question when you look at what happened in the story as it unfolded. There in John chapter 20 and verse 2, we read as Mary came to the tomb, she ran in verse 2 and went to Simon Peter and the other disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, and she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Here was Mary, a follower of Jesus. She'd heard him preach and her immediate conclusion that morning wasn't that he had been resurrected, was that he had been stolen. In that sense, she reached initially an incorrect conclusion about Jesus. And so did the disciples, frankly. When Peter and John arrived, their biblical ignorance led them to their own confusion. It says in verses 6 to 9, when Simon Peter came following John and went into the tomb, he saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet, it says, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. What does it mean when it says they saw and believed? Well, in some sense it might just mean that they believed that he wasn't there. The tomb was empty. It doesn't necessarily at this point, I think, stand as a witness to the fact that they believed he was resurrected because the next verse says they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So Mary and the first disciples, when first presented with this amazing circumstance, struggled to believe it. And those are common feelings for many people, even 
today, maybe even more so. False conclusions, incomplete conclusions. But I ask the question again, if there is a God, and just suspend, suspend your, your imagination for a moment and just ask yourself, if there is a God, why couldn't this happen? Why couldn't it happen? If he made this world and everything in it, and he created you out of nothing, and he hung the planets and the stars in the skies, why couldn't this happen? Encountering Jesus is what actually brings us to faith. And that's what happened to Mary and to the disciples. In John 19, beginning in verse 19, that evening, later that day, for the disciples, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And then the disciples were very glad when they saw the Lord. And what followed was that famous conversation between Jesus and Thomas, the doubter. And they believed. Not just that the tomb was empty, but that Christ was risen. And Mary, in John chapter 20, in verse 10 to 16, says this, The disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, right between verse 13 and 14, I just want you to put yourself there for a moment. Put the camera in the tomb. Here's Mary talking to an angel. And she's standing there, and she's weeping, and she's crying, and she's not sure what to do or think. She's astonished that there's an angel. It's a little bit scary. He says, she says to him, I don't know where they've laid him. And I can just see the angel looking at Mary, whose back is facing out of the tomb, and the angel does something like this. And having said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing. But she didn't know at first that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I'll take him. And then this verse just gets me every time. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and she said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni. He said her name in a way that only he could say it. How do we encounter Jesus in faith? It's when Jesus speaks our name in a way that only he can. And I know many of you in this room have had that happen. At some point in your life, Jesus said your name to you. It happened to me when I was six years old. A lot of these kids down here today, six years old. My parents went to a revival. They were, uh, my mother was a Christian scientist. My father was a lapsed Roman Catholic, and they went to a Baptist church revival, and Jesus said their name to both of them. I wasn't there, though. I was at home. And the first thing my mother did is she came in my room and she got me out of bed and she told me about Jesus. And Jesus said my name. At six years old, I bowed and I asked Jesus to come and live in my heart. I don't know how that happened other than that he said my name. And it wasn't until college until I really grasped the idea that I was saved by grace and not through my works, finally and completely, But in a whole new way that day, he spoke something into my heart that has never, ever left me. The question for you this morning is, he said your name. You know, it's one thing to come to church. It's one thing to sing the songs. It's one thing uh, to to act like uh, we believe. It's another thing to respond when Jesus calls your name. You know, when you're in a crowd and you're looking for your friend and it's a lot going on and then all of a sudden you hear that voice and they call, hey, Chris, and you're like, ah. That name, that voice, and you see them, and you're glad. That's what Jesus does. Death is not the end for those who've had their name called. 
That's why we can say, where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? But what difference, ultimately, does the resurrection make? I want to speak to two, two types of people here. What difference does it make for those who already believe? You know, for some of you who are older, you've done this dozens and dozens of time, times to come to Easter service. Some of you that are younger, maybe not so many. What does this day do in the lives of those who believe? Romans 6, 8 says, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. And the living that we will do with him should inspire three really important things for all of us. The first is humility. Not arrogance, not pride, not giving off the sense that we know everything about everything, but humility. We should be marked by our humility. We are saved not by our works, but by the works of Christ. Humility. It should second inspire faith. In this way, if Christ defeated sin and death, What can't he do for you? You say, no, I got a disease that the doctors told me is terminal. No, I've got a a relationship with my child that's utterly and completely broken. No, God can't do that. And I say to you, what can't he do? if he's defeated sin and death. I'm not saying he will fix all of those things in this life. I know he will fix them in the life that is to come. But what can't he do? The third thing is, it should inspire greater rest. You're not on a treadmill. You don't have to please Jesus in a perfect way for him to love you. Tim Keller, the late Tim Keller, once said, relax. You are more sinful than you could ever dare imagine. And you are more loved and accepted than you could ever dare hope. That's what the resurrection should do for you if you already believe. What about those who don't believe yet? Matthew 16 says, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? I think this day should at least do two things if you don't believe today, or if you're struggling to believe, or if this doesn't seem to make sense, or it seems crazy. The first thing it should do is stir up a foundational question, and here's the question. Is this world really making you soul happy? Is what's going on making you glad in your soul? If your answer is is no, then I'd ask you, what would it take? And if the answer back is more money or a better job or less pain or whatever, I fear that you're just going to find yourself in more angst because nobody finds happiness and gladness in their soul through those things. And isn't it true that depression and anxiety and hopelessness are sky high? They're higher than they've ever been, and yet we have more stuff than we've ever had. Christianity offers a radical alternative to this dog-eat-dog, pull-up-yourself-by-your-own-bootstraps, karma-driven, externally-focused world that we live in. It says you can have rest as a gift from the eternal God. And what he asks of you is simply that you cry out to him and say, I can't do it unless you do it in me. The second thing, for those that don't yet believe, they should consider a a critical comparison. On the one hand is the future hope which is offered to us by secularism. What is that future hope? Nothing. Nothing. They'll say that themselves. When you die, that's it. Poof, you're gone. You remember nothing. You didn't even know that you lived. 
or did something spectacular while you were here. And you say, oh, well, people will remember me. Well, they die, and they go, poof, and they're gone too, and they don't remember that you lived. And that's the way it goes and goes and goes. What is the hope offered by that idea of a worldview? And how do you reattach meaning to your life if that's the way everybody ends up? Poof, you're gone, nothing. People think Christians are crazy. (laughs) That's what's offered on the one hand, the secularism. What's offered on the other hand is the future hope that Jesus gives to us. What's that? Eternal joy with the Father and all those who have gone before us in faith in a world without sin or sorrow or pain forever. You know, the pyramids are famous for dead mummies and their treasures. The European cemeteries are famous for the dead poets and kings and artists buried in them. Medina is famous for the dead prophet Muhammad's tomb. Arlington Cemetery is famous because of the resting place of fallen U.S. soldiers. But the garden tomb is famous because it's empty. It's empty. That's why, to the astonishment of sociologists, Christianity is still growing in the world. Did you know that the birth rate in the world is 0.87 per person and the rate of Christian growth is 1.1? This is not a dying religion. It's a growing religion. Why? Because I think in the end people are starting to ask themselves the question, what is this world giving me to give me relief? And they see that Jesus has an answer that abides. Don't be led, friends, to the wrong conclusions. Don't be confused. The truth is that there is only one way into the eternal garden of life, and that way is through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, whose resurrection we celebrate today. Christ the Lord is risen today. Alleluia. Sons of men and angels say, Alleluia. Raise your joys and triumphs high. Alleluia. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Alleluia. Let's pray. Father, we are here this morning to breathe again because sometimes we feel like we're suffocating with the anger and the hatred and the angst and the arrogance and pride and the claims of finding happiness in stuff and cars and houses and sex and important jobs and positions were suffering and suffocating under the, the weight of these promises that can never be kept. But Father, today you offer us this alternative of joy, this lasting joy that comes through trusting in Jesus Christ alone for our salvation. And Father, we pray as we ponder this news today, as we gather with our families, even together with those who may not yet believe, Lord, that we would be witnesses to the great joy that we have received in Christ. We thank you, we praise you, and we ask that you would meet us with great joy today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together as we sing about the risen wonder of Christ the King. Alleluia. Christ the Lord is risen today.
Thank you for worshiping with us today on this Easter Sunday. Uh, If you are looking for a church home, we'd love to have you come back in the future. The children are going to gather outside with their parents after the service for the egg hunt, so watch out, people. (laughs) Things are going to be moving, all right? Would you receive the Lord's benediction? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his abiding, everlasting, eternal peace, both now and for all the days to come. Amen.